Hello and welcome to the Middle School Bookmarker Show. My name is Chris. And I'm Joellen. We are teachers reading the middle school novel Seed Folks by Paul Fleischman. And today we're covering chapters one and two. That's Anna and Kim. If you haven't read those chapters yet, you should probably go do that now and then come back and listen to our conversation about them. And by the way, we're going to get this whole show wrapped up in just 11 minutes because 11 minutes is all you need to... Spoon some beans in the ground next to a janky old garbage fridge. So we're covering seed folks. And when I wanted to do a breakdown of this, or when I found out that you were maybe interested in doing a breakdown of this, Joe Ellen, I thought there is probably no other person that I know in my life that is more of a seed folk or a seed person. You have spent a whole lot of time gardening and doing related things. Uh, what kind of stuff have you gotten into in your life that might be related to this book? Well, I'm honored that you would call me a seed folk. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, seeds have been a big part of our life. Um, in our personal garden at home started 40 years ago. But more importantly, I think the garden that um, I get to organize at school that helps feed the food insecure people of Chester County. It's been a wonderful blessing. I was just there yesterday checking over and I have things to harvest tomorrow to still take. So planting food for others who are less fortunate is really a a wealth of feeling deep inside of me. So I, I thank you for uh, working with this with me today. Thanks. Yeah. And, and I've, I read this a long time ago and I don't know if you've actually finished this yet, uh, but I think you're going to find that a lot of things that you have done are going to connect to the characters in this book. And maybe we'll be able to find some cool connections as we go. I think so. Let's start off by taking a look at the cover. Readers should always take a look at the cover to get an idea if the book is for them. It gives you clues about what some of the conflicts might be or some of the major points of the book. And looking at the cover, I, I notice a couple objects. I see what looks like to be a watering pitcher, perhaps an eggplant. A binoculars, and I guess it's a funnel. So I see some tools here, mostly for gardening. I don't know about what the funnel is, but we'll, maybe we'll find out. Do you notice anything else, Joellen? Yes, I do, Chris. I notice um, that there are several personalities on the cover of different age groups, different ethnic backgrounds, and I'm wondering how those objects that you talked about and these people are going to somehow intertwined throughout the book. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have diversity, cultural background, um, looks like diversity in ages. We got these gardening objects. I am very excited. Let's hop into chapter one. And in chapter one, our narrator is a younger teenage girl named Kim. Kim is, I think, Vietnamese. And we start off with having her standing in her apartment and she is staring at a photo of her father and she makes a comment about how she hopes that it might come alive and notice her. Yes, and she's standing there looking at this picture in front of an altar or a shrine in their home. I believe they mentioned it was the anniversary of her father's passing. She's feeling like she's unable to cry, although her mom and her sisters do cry. And at some point, Kim, later in the night, she goes and after looking at this picture of her, her father who passed away, she grabs a spoon and lima beans, which made me really scratch my head. I had no idea what she was actually exactly doing. Kim then steps out in the street and we find out that our story takes place in the setting of Cleveland and it's pretty windy. I think they say it's early spring. And Kim makes a comment about how this is very different than her v native Vietnam. I don't think they get a lot of cold, windy weather in Vietnam. Yeah, probably not. Um, and she decides that taking these beans and spoon out to this open lot near her uh, near her house. There's lots of lots of things in the lot that she has to maneuver around. One of them, I'm sure, uh, was startling to you, Chris, was rats. Two rats at her feet. So um, she kind of tells herself, "All right, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go," and she moves behind that old rusty refrigerator. And as soon as I saw rats, I would have been out. No question. <laughs> So she, she gets behind that refrigerator. And at this point, when I was first reading, I really had no idea what to expect. But then we, we see that that spoon is going to operate as kind of like a shovel. And Kim starts digging. She digs a bunch of holes. And we find out through an inner monologue from Kim that the photo she was staring at of her father, she never actually met that guy. 
it, this is pretty pretty heart wrenching. It's this is like a gut punch here. Yeah. We find out that her father passed away before she was even born, and that and that Kim never met him, never met him, and it really bothers Kim. She says this line here: uh, "When his spirit hovered over our altar." Did it even know who I was? So Kim wondered if her father, who is passed away, even recognizes her or the spirit of him even recognizes her because they never met in real life. Right. And I'm thinking perhaps that's why she wants to go out in this empty lot and dig these holes because her father was a farmer. And if she's finding it hard to feel his spirit at the altar, perhaps he'll be with her in spirit out there in the little garden that she's going to plant do you think i think it's a beautiful idea and i'm always a big fan of the phrase to control what you can control and Mm. if kim wants to feel connected to her father and she wants to feel what her father felt as a farmer and have the patience and do the hard work of farming well i that's about all you can do to, to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, experience the things that they did. And I'm sure that she'll probably feel a connection to him by the end of this endeavor, by the end of this garden. Yes, I think so. Yep. Mm-hmm. So she plants the beans, she waters them, and she promises herself that these beans are going to thrive. And I thought when I flipped the chapter to chapter two, I was going to continue with Kim. But as we find, there's a different narrator every single chapter. This is very interesting. The story continues chronologically, like straight through time, but it's told from different perspectives. Who's it told from in chapter two? Well, we're now um, listening to Anna and her story. Anna is an older woman who has uh, been in this area all of her life. Well, I guess she was four years old, I think, when she moved there from Romania. And she sits in her apartment and looks out the window and she comments that she doesn't need a TV or anything to do because she has a little bit of a view of Lake Erie and she has a whole apartment full of windows that she can observe. Hmm. I find this a little creepy. I certainly, uh, I certainly would rather flip through YouTube or Netflix or something than staring out at my my neighbor's windows. But, I mean, whatever. If it makes her happy, <laughs> I was um, I was hoping that she was going to be a keen observer. But you're right; it may be a little more like she's just nosy. Well, I, I hope that she. She probably will become a keen observer, maybe <laughs> while we're watching the garden, but we're getting ahead to our ahead of yeah. ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so she goes on to describe how she's lived there forever. And she she moved out for a point, but then came back because she wanted to take care of her mother. And she goes on and on for about two pages about the changes in this area. And one of the main things she talks about is how this area of Cleveland was always really impoverished. And it was often a place where immigrants who freshly came to the country would go to live. Imagine getting to a country and not being either really good at speaking English or not speaking any English. When you get off the boat and you and you need a place to live, you probably want to go to people, go around people that speak the same language at you, language as you. And over time, different cultural groups lived in this, this area, one of them being Romanian, and it's, which is when Anna came in, and it evolved over time. Um, you might have heard in social studies class that this, these were called ghettos. The original version meant that when people came up fresh off the boat from other countries and they all grouped up together, like all the Italians would live here, the Polish would live here, the Roman, Romanians would live there. That was the original definition of ghettos. I, and I like the description in there um, when she's talking about her neighborhood, because as you said, at one point, many of the Romanians were there, but it says, quote, the neighborhood was like a cheap hotel. You only stay until you have enough money to leave. So what might that tell us not only about Anna, but about the people that were also living there? They, they probably are not thrilled to be there. It's, it's, this is more like a stepping stone. This isn't exactly where they want to end up. <gasps> Joellen, we got about a minute left. We've got to blast oh. through the rest of these points. Okay, <laughs> so the area is really abandoned and dilapidated. People leave. They don't stay and take care of the place. Uh, she also, Anna goes on to explain that it was made worse because factories shut down, which meant that jobs were, weren't available in the area. So all in all, this is just an area that never really grew into a very nice place to live, which is why 
when Anna spots Kim in the garden, she doesn't assume, or in the dirty lot, she doesn't assume nice things. What does she assume, Joe Ellen? Well, of course, she's assuming that, oh, there must be something bad going on there. This girl is digging. She must be hiding something. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's money she stole. Maybe it's a gun. Very mm. vicious. Um, and... So Kim, um, so she, she spots, Anna spots Kim going out to this lot over and over and over. And Anna has this cool line where she says, my curiosity was like a fever inside of me. So this old lady carries herself downstairs. She goes down with a butter knife, I think. Yeah. And she wants to dig around and see what what's up with this gun or what's up with these, these drugs or what's up with this illegal thing that's getting buried. Uh, it turns out that it is not that. Instead of drugs or a gun, it's beans. And she says, the truth of it slapped me full in the face. I said to myself, what have you done? Why do you think she thought that, Joellen? Well, I'm sure a little bit of uh, disappointment, but a lot more of a surprise. And here, this, and if you've planted a seed of any kind and you've seen it sprout and you've seen it grow and you've seen the persistence it takes to sprout through the dirt, she is like, oh, what have I done? What have I done? Um, and I think she's feeling very bad. Because she might have killed the she seed. Might have killed the seeds. And she does, in fact, tenderly replant each one of them and hope that Kim doesn't notice anything. And then she goes out and buys some binoculars. So maybe she's going to spend a little less time staring in her neighbor's window and more at the garden. And this story is coming together in a beautiful way. Make sure you guys hit like, subscribe, hit the bell, whatever other stuff YouTube throws down there. Next time we are doing chapters three and four. Those are the characters Wendell and Gonzalo. We will see y'all later. See you later.